coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. The FBI raided a data center and took several popular websites offline, and we'll share the details of that story with you. Then, WordPress had a major compromise this week, and several backdoors were added to many popular plugins, and we have the details to find out if your site was affected. After that, it's Dropbox's shockingly bad week of security. I mean, egregious, and we have all the details on that. And then after that, we'll tell you why it's often good to serve a little bit of salt with your passwords. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone and welcome back to TechSnap. My name is Chris and this is the 11th episode and it was filmed live on June 22nd. Joining me on the Skype line is my co-host Alan. Hey there Alan, how you doing? Hey Chris, how are you? Hey, man, I'm good. So we're doing this show early. So for those of you who yes. tuned in on Thursday hoping to catch snack, Tech Snap Live, uh, we had to uh, make it a temporary arrangement. We shot this episode on a Wednesday, but we'll be back at our regular live time next week. So just regular Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. So apologies to those of you who missed us, um, but uh, just sometimes you got to bump things around, right? Right, yeah. Alan? That's yeah. the way it goes. Yep. Now, uh, Alan... I was making a joke earlier before we recorded it. This this show doc that we have for today's show might be the longest doc I think we've ever had for any show. I mean, we have a serious show today, and I think it's going to have bits and pieces in it that will appeal to every TechSnap fan out there. So I'm really excited yep. about today's show. Uh, should we? St- with that said, should we just jump? Oh, wait. You know what? Actually, I want to give ourselves a little self-plug. Um, yep. Last week, we launched the new TechSnap Reddit page. And uh, I am thrilled. It's still it's still just starting. We've only got 28 readers out there. So if you're a Reddit user, join us over at reddit.com slash r slash techsnap or what was the custom? Didn't we do a custom links. URL? It's links.techsnap.tv. That's what it was. And that's where you can submit questions or stories or vote on them. And then we can yep. take those in and weigh in what we cover uh, in today's show, was, for example, or in future shows based on what your guys' input is on our Reddit page. So that's been really awesome, and uh, I yeah, wanted to say so thanks to people who joined us there. It lets users kind of direct uh, what we want to talk about. Yeah, and it, you can kind of gauge what the interest is. So you know, yeah. Yeah, we know like what, how much, how how people are interested in, for example, in today's episode, we're able to weigh a Dropbox security story versus a Bitcoin security story to see where the interest lies in there. And, and if yep. you want to have your input uh, in that, you can go over to the page and vote away. Just a Reddit account needed, but hey, that's free, um, yep. and it's easy enough. You want to start with our uh, first story there, Alan? What do you think? Sure. Okay, now this started. one, this one, Alan, I'm a little, I'm a little upset about because it actually mm-hmm. affected me uh, personally. I'll, I'll let you set it up, but uh, the, uh, the, the big headline here is the FBI seized web servers, knocking several sites offline this last week. Right, and you know that's not all that abnormal for the FBI to go in, and seize web servers based on information with a sure. warrant and so yeah. on. Uh, but this time, they might have gone a little too far. Uh, at 1 a.m. on Tuesday. The FBI raided a data center in Virginia uh, and took equipment from a Swift uh, web hosting company called Digital One. Yeah. Uh, but basically, they were after one specific customer, and they had been in contact with Digital One, and Digital One said, all right, for that IP address, it's this server. And so that's the one you want to seize. And the FBI seized three entire racks of equipment. Yeah. Yeah, knocking sites like uh, Pinboard offline, yep. which we use for... Uh, Bookmarking stories for our sites. Yep. And, and uh, uh, they knocked uh, Instapaper offline. Yep. And a number of other uh, major sites. Yep. And uh, also Digital One's own website is offline. Yeah, yeah. Even still now. I was checking to see if it's up yet. Nope. It's digital1.com is still I've, not uh, loading. I've always felt weird about uh, hosting companies that don't have some backup system for their website so that if they are down for whatever reason, you can still, you know, find their page with their phone number. Yeah, on but it, how like much, that. how much egg is it on your face if, like, when you go down, you have like your DNS redirected like to some freebie Squarespace blog for a, for a couple of days? That's kind of embarrassing, too. Right. Well, Scale Engine's website has four layers of failover, and none well, of them are free. There you go. There is that too, right? If yeah. you build it in yourself, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's funny. So I can't go to their site, so I can't get like an official update from them. I have to probably, I guess, I'd have to find it right. through other means. Uh, uh, maybe they have a Twitter account or something. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the New York Times has been doing a pretty good job of following this story. They've got uh, yes. updates all uh, along. Because they had a list of some of the other. Uh, sites that were affected like yeah. uh, curbed network i don't yep. even know what that is but 
They're uh, it's real estate blogs, food blogs, and uh, things like yeah. that. And so, just yeah, their this, business this totally knocked offline. This seems to have quite a few fairly major Web 2.0 properties. I, I guess it's because there's the, there's that set of people that are like, we only want physical hardware, and these guys, I guess, have some pretty good deals for some pretty robust physical hardware. So yeah. I, I think that it attracts that crowd. Yeah, because one of the things that I noticed is what it appears to be with Digital One, because they're located in Switzerland, uh, is that they don't actually have any staff on site where the hardware is. They rely on remote hands from the data center operator, CoreSite. Yeah. Uh, so... And, but because of this, Digital One was not aware of what the problem was until hours later when the data center called them and told them. Uh, basically, at first, when all their sites went offline, they figured it was something wrong with a router or a switch or something to that effect. Uh, but then later, when they were contacted by their uh, data center operator, it's like, no, the FBI came and took three racks of your gear. Uh, here's the you know, contact information for the FBI agent who you'll want to talk to. And, and what do you do in that scenario? The FBI needs a single server. They take racks of servers. They knock multiple customers offline. These guys don't even have a physical presence, so they think it's like some sort of technical outage. You're kidding me. I mean, this yes. is just fail after fail, and it kind of seems like, honestly, the FBI is like a physical version of a hacker group. I mean, this kind of outage is affecting these companies much more severely than a, than a DDoS or some sort of lulsec prank because in yep. those scenarios, you can usually restore from a backup, reboot your system, and you're back online. These right. companies have no repercussion. Pinboard is running in some sort of limited mode where he has limited API and RSS feeds. Uh, right. Digital it's, One themselves are, are down. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is no worse. This is well, worse because, than an attack from a hacker. Yes, because it seems that, you know, when you take entire racks of equipment, if they took routers and switches and stuff too, then it's like, well... We don't even have the networking gear to get the rest of the stuff back online. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times, those kind of data centers run near capacity, not complete capacity, ideally. But right. you don't want to have a lot of excess hardware sitting around that you could just fire up anytime because that's yeah. money just sitting on the table. And when you take three racks, I mean, sure, maybe a couple of servers of a couple of different variations, but three racks of gear, that, that is not yeah. something you could just bounce back from. No. It's, and, uh, it's, it should be criminal. Yeah. Well, it's, it seems to me that the search warrant should have been much more specific, right? Like normally a search warrant says, you know, you can search somebody's office in their car or something like that, but it doesn't let you, you know, if, if somebody gets a warrant to search your office at work, it'll be specific to your office. They can't go through every cubicle in the building. Right. Uh, D Digital One that, in an email to their customers stated that they thought that maybe the FBI misunderstood and thought that the entire rack was a server, like they didn't understand how it worked, and so they, well, they thought the racks were servers. Well, if they're a data center, they should, the FBI should have people that know the difference <laughs> between rack and a server. You'd hope so, dude, but you never know, right? I mean, it's possible. Well, it's just like for evidentiary purposes, you want to make sure you have somebody yeah. that knows how to turn the machine off properly and things like that. Right, you'd think they would, if yeah, if they're trying to protect the evidence, they'd have an idea of what they're looking at. You'd hope. Yeah. Otherwise, you they, would hope. Yeah. I mean, but if they only and needed the evidence, the only thing they really need is the hard drives. They don't need to take all of the gear because as right. soon as you power those things off, the state on the processors and memory is completely wiped yeah. anyways. They don't have any information. But it also depends, for example, like with Windows, the machine doesn't necessarily want to boot if it's not exactly the same hardware. Oh, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. If you got to get them up and running again, if you don't just need the data. Yeah. But in this case, they were after apparently one server and took three whole racks, which if you figure regular 42U rack or whatever, that's like... 120 servers or so that they took. And probably and batteries. and Apparently maybe some, uh, some of it was uh, blade servers. So that so it could be a lot more, though. It could be a lot more. It could be... So you like, yeah, in 8Us, you can have 10 or 12 blades or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so And technically, you could say that the whole blade is one server. But it's hard to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Any other thoughts on that one? Digital One uh, isn't saying what the name of the company that the FBI was after is obviously probably for like four reasons. Yeah. They don't want to, they have their customers privacy to consider, but also, you know, the FBI probably doesn't want them saying and so on. Uh, part of the, some rumors that have been going around is that the raid was uh, part of the investigation into LulzSec. Huh. What do you think of that? Might explain why the FBI was uh, maybe a little over eager. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, one of the stories I read uh, was that they were in a cooperative legal strike with a task force based out of the UK. And as we know, it's in our LulzSec roundup uh, later in the show notes, um, one of the LulzSec members, perhaps the leader, was found in the UK. 
So the rumors that it's tied to Lulsec and the rumors, I guess, in a news report from the from the New York Times that they were working with another law enforcement agency out of the country, they kind of add up. The numbers, you know, you can connect the dots and et cetera, et cetera, math. Yep. So interesting enough, um, it sucks for those other guys, though. It really does yeah. suck. It, mm. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, almost, it's almost the same, it's almost to me the same equivalency. Yeah. The end, the end result is actually worse. So, uh, any other thoughts, or do you want to move on to this WordPress story? I think we're ready to move on. Okay, so this is uh, a little troubling for you WordPress users out there, uh, like uh, like my Alan. Mm. Do you use WordPress anywhere? I don't actually. But yeah, you lucky, you lucky dog, because uh, the WordPress because, had a bad week. Uh, right? I'm lazy and I. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was because you had issues with uh, WordPress or something. So. Uh, not specifically, uh, but most of my sites run my own custom CMS because I built that and why not use it right not well, yeah that makes sense uh so uh wordpress had kind of a nasty hack then and, and they've reset just about everyone has a wordpress.com account uh, uh i think wordpress.org wordpress.org sorry wordpress.com is their commercial hosting thing wordpress.org is right. the open source right right so uh, uh what happened here man well they're not entirely sure they don't know that they were hacked or what happened uh but they noticed a bunch of uh commits to the plugin repository that had cleverly hidden backdoors in them. Uh, so somebody with access to a number of developer accounts went in there and inserted malicious code into plugins like W3 Total Cache, which Jupyter Broadcasting uses, yep. uh, add this and WP Touch. And I'm glad I haven't been doing my updates recently. That's like the only time I've ever been glad about that. <laughs> right, and so um, WordPress rolled back the changes so that the uh, backdoor wasn't there and then Forced that to look like a new version, and so anybody who was auto updating would auto update again and get rid of the back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, the, one of the but things it might that, be a little too late for that. One of the things that I think to tell in the story here, Alan, is the fact that it was a their first response was a password reset across all of the accounts. Well, and that's one way to ensure that if an account, if a bunch of accounts were compromised, that it would stop. But it kind of sounds like it might have just been a simple password issue. Um, I don't know. If or you think they're just playing it safe? They're just they're just being like Part we don't know think, for yes, sure. They did say you know it was a prophylactic step, which is them t playing it safe. But uh, a, isn't a prophylactic what you use to poop? No, prophylactic is a condom. Oh, okay, okay. So they're like, okay, boy, so those protection. Those two things got creepily crossed in my mind. I must say <laughs> that's that's not good. But uh, I'm what can I yeah. say? I'm just an innocent little farm boy. I didn't know any better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so this really sucks. So what do we know if people who would I got one of those plugins installed on their WordPress site, would they have then been essentially uh, compromised? Possibly. P possibly. Uh, WordPress has some information about it on their site, but basically they forced an extra update after that. So hopefully not too many sites got owned. Another password issue is my opinion. Um, any other Probably. thoughts on this one? But well, it's just because it affects so many plugins, it doesn't seem like it, one password would have got them all that much. Unless you got like some sort of account that was an administrative level account, right? I, mean, I don't know. Yes, yeah, or you, it could have been related to the previous hack uh, a couple months ago that we talked about, where they got the uh, Facebook API and got, the Twitter APIs, and right? They, well, they got root on the servers. If maybe they forced everybody to reset their passwords, but somebody reset their password to the same thing. Or, oh, right, and then they just used that <laughs> man. Yeah. Hmm. You, you never know. Uh, it could also have been some other site where somebody hacked uh, a password, got passwords, and that user happened to be using a, an at wordpress.org email address, and they're like, well, I'm going to go try this password at that domain and see if it lets me into anything. Yeah. And that's yeah, which, why you never use the same password for different services. Well, hold your thoughts there, because I think we're going to talk about that in just a little bit um, in, 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 our, uh, in our story towards the bottom. Um, yep. Do you want to talk about the Adobe thing? Uh, sure. All right. So this this is rather nasty one that people kind of need to be aware about. And if you're running one of yeah. the later browsers, they should warn you. But Adobe has patched a second zero day flaw in like like as short as like nine days. Is that what it is? Yeah. It's only a couple days apart. So basically, Adobe pushes updates on a regular schedule, but twice now they've done what's called an out of band security update, where they force one right away because it's important. Uh, so this the, uh, this was for Flash Player. So before there was also yep. one for the PDF, which fixed 13 yep. new bugs in the Adobe PDF Reader. Oh, my goodness. Right. <laughs> I think that was a regular in-band update, though. Okay. Uh, but yeah, one of the two Azure Day exploits was actively being used to steal people's Gmail passwords. Um, and then the second one was listed as critical because it might allow an attacker to take complete control of your system. 
Wow. Through yeah. Flash. So you browse to a site that has Flash. They exploit a vulnerability in the Flash player, and then they own your system. Right. Now, to get affected by this, you would probably have to go somewhere that had this bad Flash. Uh, but if you remember, the attack on RSA that we talked about, what happened there is somebody sent in an Excel file with an Adobe Flash embedded in it. Yeah. And they're like, hey, I'm your manager. I need you to look at this Excel file. An Excel and file, of all things. Yeah. And so they open it up, and it fires off this embedded Flash and, you know, exploit it. I love that that's how you hook an RSA employee is with, ex with spreadsheets. <laughs> but here you go. Here's a spreadsheet. Don't you want to open the spreadsheet? Yeah. yeah well, what it, about but, something like, what about, now, now, this obviously would be a multi-factor attack, but this is not beyond what we've seen recently, but... And I don't mean to, you know, put anything on Justin TV, but just in this example, what if somebody compromised Justin TV and just replaced the SWF file on the Justin TV server so that then everybody that has a Justin everything. TV in bed would, would yep. be then infecting all of their viewers? Exactly. Like, that's one of the nightmare well, scenarios. You know, like uh, page gets compromised. Leo, Leo like, Laporte's uh, Twit Live page was just compromised recently, and right. I don't know the and, details that they had to clean it up. Right, but somebody could have in uploaded malicious flash on there that would have infected everybody that went there kind of scary yeah especially with the zero day because it means there's no fix for it yet right and that's why you see all those really super obnoxious adobe updates if you're on windows or the mac they yeah they're constantly obnoxious for up. a reason yeah because i know I, you really do really really need to make sure you install those yeah and that's probably the best thing chrome does right is it's really good about keeping flash up to date theoretically because well because chrome comes bundled with flash when there's a new flash update they do a full chrome update and Right, so and I think Chrome is there. working on sandboxing. It's not yet, I don't think, but I believe they're working on sandboxing Flash as well so that if Flash has an issue, it's at least contained. Right. That'd be good. Uh, yeah, it, it is when you become but the standard of with, the web especially like with, this. Uh, with our uh, streaming video service that we're doing at Scale Engine, mm. I see the version numbers of Flash people are using. You'd be amazed how many people are still using like Flash 10.1 or 9 point something. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. So like I see the same thing. You need to run the newest Flash, which is like 10.3. Jupiter Broadcasting viewers seem to be like within the last three versions on average. Yeah. So... Uh, well, specifically, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but Flash 10.3 provides a bunch of privacy updates. Which is for, just a feature uh, for Flash you want. cookies, right? Yeah. For, especially with Flash cookies. So it's something you want anyway. So make sure you have the latest Flash 10.3 point whatever it is. Yeah. Remember, everybody, patch your S as we always say yes. on TechSnap, and that includes Flash, exactly. even if it is obnoxious. Because I know you got to yeah. close your browser, and sometimes some of the Adobe updates, you got to reboot. I know that's a pain in the butt. Um, yeah, but I know how it is. I have four different browsers open, and I have to close them all. <laughs> yeah, I hate It's that. like, I have like four tabs in this one, and I don't want to close them, but I have yep. to. Yep. Yep. Uh, any, other, any other thoughts on Adobe's bad news, or should we move on to Dropbox's uh, bad news? Not really. It's just, uh, you know, people need to be aware that this stuff happens, and yeah. you can't just ignore it. Right. Word for that. You got to be patching. Um, or, and keep watching TechSnap. That way you find out about it. Right? There you go. Exactly. Um, now, full disclosure, still a Dropbox user myself, but every story pushes me further and further away. Now, the re main reason I've maintained my Dropbox user status is because pretty much everything I store in Dropbox eventually becomes public anyways because I mainly just use it for show production. All our shows get released. They're creative commons. If somebody got my Dropbox, you'd get, you know, TechSnap before it was really ready to go kind of a thing. Not a huge deal. But I got to be honest, every now and then I realize I've stuck something in my Dropbox that I actually would be concerned if, you know, like maybe it's a receipt or something. Not a big deal, but it kind yeah. of starts to walk that line. So when I see stories here about Dropbox security, and, and in this one in particular, it's so, it's so outrageously bad. Egregious. It's, it's, it, it's ridiculous. egregious, yes, that I, I, I just almost on principle want to stop using the service. Alan, what happened here, man? What, what dear Alan, happened with Dropbox? Uh, so Dropbox pushed a code update on their site, and apparently some flaw in it allowed people to log in without checking their password. Yep. So you just type whatever you want in the password box, and as long as you have the valid username, you were logged in as that user. Womp it's, womp. It makes absolutely no sense so how, how the authentication system even works like that. It's a period of like, four hours, uh, and yeah. uh, they say only 1% of the accounts were accessed. So they claim less than 1% of the users logged in during that time, which seems incredibly low for a four-hour period. Now, what they could popular. be referring to is the website, right? Because you don't log in yeah. from the Dropbox client. So maybe yeah, the web the usage is super low. And, and their web client does kind of suck. It's not that good. Yeah. Well, the other thing is they use really long session times. 
So people that were logged in before the update wouldn't have had to log in again. So they weren't, they didn't log in during that time. True. They were already right. logged in. Right, right. But it seems like a big, fat, gaping hole in security there. Now, the, the, I think the other part that is, is equally kind of bad about this is they were really bad about telling people. Right. And, you know, uh, as we saw with LastPass, LastPass, to, to maybe even losing some street cred, raised a flag saying, we think something might be bad. We don't know for sure, but we're just telling you the second we find out. Well, the um, same thing happened with WordPress, right? They said something hinky was going on, we reverted it, and we're forcing everybody to change their password right away because why wait? Yeah. Force everybody to change their password and figure out what happened after. Yeah. Uh, but the Dropbox right. folks, while publicly admitting it uh, two days ago, so the day after, they only today, three days later, emailed um, users. And what and they've done is... That, that 1% of people that logged in during that time were sent a, an activity report on their account so they right. could tell if any of it wasn't them. This is this is the Achilles heel for Dropbox is if they can't yeah. get their security under control, their service well, is dead. There's a couple of problems here. First of all, anybody that knows your email address or username can log into your account, which is horrible. So maybe, you know, make, uh, something people do, and I understand why they do it, but you should maybe use separate uh, usernames and or email addresses for different services so that it's harder for people to connect your accounts between those separate services and so that when something like this happens... People can't guess what your username for Dropbox is. Of course, for Dropbox, I think if you public, if you make a file public, your username is in the URL or something, right? Mm, so if, it, if this had happened, yeah. then and I knew specifically who you were, I could go in and access your files, and I could have changed a file that you're sharing publicly. So if you linked something in Dropbox for download for you know everybody in the Jupiter Broadcasting audience to right. access, right? I could have replaced that with something malicious. Yeah. Yes. And that is... And another thing is, because of the way Dropbox works, like we talked about the f some of the flaws that they haven't fixed from like the very first episode of TechSnap, someone who accessed your account using this passwordlessness uh, could have gone in and authorized additional devices. Yeah, yeah. And then they could use those devices to continue to access your files forever yeah. until you go and remove that device. Now, the good news is I've been following the Dropbox developer forum over at, like, the Dropbox forum, and they are actively working on that those client-side database issues, you know, where you could take the database. The and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're working on there. So they've got that in their current betas right now. That's fixed. Really, it's a fundamental flaw with the whole way they architect the entire thing, and I don't see them being able to fix it without taking away a lot of the features that people like of Dropbox. The mainstream media is playing this up as the death blow to the cloud with question mark kind of a thing. And to me, I think it's just... There are just plenty of other cloud storage systems out there that aren't as popular that are per almost like hundreds of times more secure. There you go. But they're not as popular because that additional security comes at a cost. It does, and it comes at another... Uh, often they, they have another layer of complexity to them. I mean, people, right. people love this small little utility that runs in the background that just sits above the file system. You know, right. That's a pretty but, killer but combo. Basically, if Dropbox used proper encryption, where they have one a separate key for every user, and that key was protected by the user's password, then that means that without your actual password, nobody could have accessed your files. Right. However, that would mean that each of those clients that you had would have to have that password to encrypt your files, and that yes. would mean they would have to save that password or the key anyway, and that would actually be another vector to attack them. So it's really it's a whole mess. Yeah, it really, and account. it's a mess they don't have a good answer to. Yeah. So we're going to keep following it because obviously Dropbox, Drop, this is one of the highest voted stories on our, our TechSnap Reddit yeah, sub forum. Because a so. lot of people use it and yeah. I can understand why, but they really have to be cognizant of the gaping security holes that are that, that yeah. they're accepting in order for this additional ease of use. Any other thoughts on this story? Um, not really. Okay. Now this next story Boy, this one cuts deep, and it really underscores a, a sort of a trend we have in this episode is password management yep. and being smart about your password management. So during the last Linux Action Show uh, Sunday, uh, Bitcoin dropped to a penny during the show, and I could not believe my eyes when I saw that. And uh, it looks like now that was the result of MT Gox, the primary exchange to get U.S. dollars primarily into Bitcoin or Bitcoin into U.S. dollars was hacked, and a pretty significant hack. Yeah. Uh, so apparently, and you weren't affected by this, but I was. I have an MT Gox right. account. Well, I was slightly affected. Uh, oh, I used a different exchange, a Canadian one, but the price went down there too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So this one's a really complex story. I mean, this is much more complex than you would think it sounds because we've had multiple versions of what happened from the yep. um, from the Mount Gox folks. Uh, we've also got community members coming out saying that they've known about issues and they believe this is what happened. And then also, somebody responsible for buying about 300,000 Bitcoins during the crash came out and gave his side of the story. Yeah. Uh, Alan, what is your takeaway from the story so far? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't have time to read everything about it. Uh, but there were a couple technical things that I saw that... Oh, lay it on me. ...made a problem. Uh, but apparently what happened was uh, an account was compromised and uh, that had a lot of coins in it. And they sold all their coins. Uh, and doing so because they had such a large number of coins that brought the price down. They then immediately used all the money they made from selling all those coins to buy the coins back at the lower price. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and then they tried to cash out, but the empty Gox limit of $1,000 a day uh, stopped them from getting away with too much money. Yeah, and so people who are drawing the conspiracies here think that that empty Gox limit that they put in place just a few days ago happened because uh, there started to become um, some postings on Pastebin and a few other sites. Hey, I've got the empty Gox user database. Email me here if you want to see it. In fact, I've got a link to that in the TechSnap uh, subreddit. And yeah. uh, in there, it's that then that day, empty Gox um, uh, starts a, a limit, a thousand dollar a day limit. A thousand Bitcoin a day limit. And then after that, a, sequ a sequential event starts to happen in the Bitcoin forums where you will see a lot of people posting my, my empty Gox account. My Mt. Gox account was hacked. My account was emptied. I lost 200 Bitcoin or I lost whatever. And people were like, what's going on here? What is happening? And it's starting to look like potentially there's a couple of scenarios from what I've followed on the story. One is it's exactly what you just said. Somebody just compromised somebody's password and they happen to have almost 500,000 Bitcoins in their account, which would roughly be about 7% of the total Bitcoins in circulation. So this is not sounding very likely. And then that person who had all of those just sitting in a Mt. Gox account and then they cashed them out at a penny. Mm -hmm. Then somebody watching the market very closely had an auto buy for, uh, if it got to 101 cents, buy. And then they tried to buy them all back at that point. Other people are suggesting that what actually happened is that people used a known documented uh, SQL injection vulnerability in Mt. Gox to actually inject a fake Bitcoin dollar amount into a SQL table. Because when you're in Mt. Gox, all of the transactions are only happening in the database. You're not actually exchanging real Bitcoins. In fact, that's how Mt. Gox is even able to roll back. They're not actually rolling back Bitcoin transactions because that's impossible. It's impossible. They're just rolling back database changes. Right, and because the Bitcoins and the money sit in pools at Mt. Gox, right. uh, they can just swap the ownership around. And that's and so... It, the another thing people were saying is that maybe the reason they, somebody had an account that had that many Bitcoins in it to be able to fluctuate the market like that is that they use SQL injection to just give themselves coins that didn't actually exist. Yeah. So, they, so it sounds like a combination of po potentially some database manipulation and password compromising. Yeah, uh, so empty Gox claim on their website uh, from a couple days ago, it hasn't been updated in like two days, uh, was that a third party auditor they have that who had read only access to their database to do the auditing, uh, their computer was compromised and somebody managed to make off with a copy of the database. Yeah, maybe. And they also said yeah. that accounts that were older than two months right. didn't uh, have salted passwords in, 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 in the database. Two months ago, they changed their uh, yeah. password hashing uh, system. Instead of using, originally what they used was just a plain MD5 hash, which is horribly weak. We've talked about this before. But we keep uh, seeing that people are using this. Yeah, because people don't know better, right? They write PHP or MySQL statements and they just wrap the password in MD5 and they're like, yeah, it's hashed. Yeah. But, you know, a GPU can hack like millions and millions of MD5 hashes per second. And more importantly, there are rainbow tables. You can go and type in an MD5 hash on a couple of different websites that contain these databases, and it'll tell you what the password is right off. Oh, in, wow. In like a second. Really? Right? Because so it's essentially they, not because, encrypted at all. Because a, hash is, because a hash is deterministic, if you right. hash the same thing twice, you get the same result. Right. So a rainbow table is just a giant table of, we tried hashing everything up to 10 characters or whatever, right. and we wrote them all down, so we can just look them up. Amazing. So Amazing. that's why uh, salts come in. And we'll get into this in a minute. Uh, one of our users sent a question asking us to explain what salted hashing is. Yeah. And, and I've got a really long answer for it. So, so we'll save that for the Q&A section? In just a minute. Okay. Uh, but uh, about two months ago, 
MD Gox changed to using the FreeBSD crypt function, which does salted MD5 hashes. Yeah. yeah. So those passwords will be harder to break, but it is still possible. But it takes a lot longer than a regular MD5 hash. Because on top of a salt, uh, the FreeBSD crypt mechanism actually does the MD5 100 times, not just once. Ah. So that makes it 100 times slower. Yeah. Plus, with the salt, that's eight characters of randomness uh, that make it much harder to do a rainbow table or to brute force the password. So they say they're implementing now, if you go and reclaim your account, which you have to do, they yep. say they're using uh, SHA-512 uh, multi-iteration salted hashing. Yes. Somewhere they said triple salted. I have no idea what they mean by that. But uh, SSH-512 multi-iteration hashing is uh, standard in a uh, number of Linux distributions now. All right, so and and that is well, a, it's available. It's not the it's not the default, but it's in there, and you can go and set it up if you want. So that's pretty robust. Yeah, uh, we'll I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in the. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Yeah, you know me. I'm uh, curious, George. But also somehow, MT Gox managed to get a hold of someone at Google, and Google uh, took the list of all MT Gox users who signed up with their Gmail account. Yep. And forced all those users to reset their password as a security. Measure. That was one. Of, I was one of them. I was one yep. of them. And I was, I was a good boy and did not use the same password. Uh, right. Last I, pass I, for I the just, win. Right. But I'm just wondering how MT Gox managed to get a hold of someone at Google. I know. Right. Or, or did Google, Google do it? Well, Google would have had to have the list of users. So they talked to somebody somewhere. Or Google. I mean, it was what my, what I'm saying is it was online. Maybe, Possibly. Maybe Google went and just grabbed themselves a copy. They did that once before with the uh, Gawker outage. They went yeah. and got the database themselves because it was just posted online, and they, yeah. they audited it for Gmail accounts. Yeah, and so uh, it's, it's pretty respectable, they, really. Because I bet you wouldn't see that happen if it was Hotmail accounts. Well, no, I'm sure there were like, Hotmail accounts. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure that happened. Most people didn't have their password reset. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I had to reset my password. I was a good boy, and I and I have been good about using different passwords everywhere, um, and especially with Bitcoin. Thing. E yep, ever since the Gawker thing. That's exactly right. And yep. I, that was my that was my red flag, and I've been doing that since. Uh, but you know, the fact that Google made me change my password has been inter interesting to see what things in my life with my different Android devices and all that stuff break. But um, I gotta say, pretty impressed with uh, Google. Also, I want to give a plug. The online wallet I've been using, my Bitcoin.com, also did the same thing. They yep. also uh, said um, if you have a, if you sign up with a Gmail account, you're going to need to change your password. And we've implemented even stronger password requirements. Yep. And uh, DeepBit and BTC Guild uh, uh, Bitcoin pools uh, posted giant notices in Pretty, like bright red saying, if you use the same password at empty Gox as you do here, you really should change that. You really have to stop doing that. And I know yeah. it sucks, everyone. I mean, I, I use LastPass yeah. and it makes it better, but it's never mm -hmm. ideal if I'm on the go. I've got them on my phone and it's just, it's yeah. sometimes it's very complicated, but it's like the equivalent of being back in the heyday of viruses and not running AV and being like on a Windows 98 box or an XP box and browsing the web on IE. It's like, you've really just got to start protecting yourself. And I know it's yeah. inconvenient, but you've got to. That's my soapbox. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's like, sure, it's inconvenient to remember or a bunch of different passwords, but it's more inconvenient to have all your money taken. Well, and what happens, whatever. like in particular, like with your Gmail account, is Google just starts this. The Google's trick is they just slowly become more and more relevant to your life as time goes on. They they hook yep. you with Gmail, and then they get you on Google Voice, and they get you on Google Reader, and they get you on all this different stuff. You got a YouTube account now, and all of a sudden, two years down the road. That Google account is a lot more critical than when it was when you signed up for it and just used your yep. generic password. And you've just got to go back and you've got to you got to do it. You got to bite and the bullet. The other thing I've said before is once they get your email, they have everything. Right? If that's the email you use to sign up for your Twitter and your Facebook, then when somebody goes there and resets your password, if they have access to your Gmail, they get your new password. Yeah. And now only they have access to your Twitter. You don't have access to your Twitter anymore. It's not like if they hack your Twitter and you have access and they have access. Only they have access now. Yeah, and you're screwed. So you lose control of your Twitter account on top of them being able to post nasty things and tell your friends or whatever. They control your account, and it's hard for you to prove to uh, Twitter that it's actually your account, not this other person's, when they have access to your email. Mm. Right? Because if they change the password in your Gmail, then how do you get your Gmail back? You lose control of everything. Yeah. <sighs> I know. It's very right? scary. You can end up losing control of your domain names. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because uh, you guys had that problem with uh, Jupyter Broadcasting, don't you? But we have. We don't have, uh, uh, we don't have the ability to log into the account 
where we have the Jupiter Broadcasting domain at like direct right. nick or something. Yeah. So we have because to. Because uh, Brian doesn't have the email address he used to have. That's what happens. If you sign up. Yep. Yeah. Then when you go to do a transfer, they have to do a contact verification yep. and they email you. So the only way to really get around that generally is to write up a letter and put it on a company Fancy letterhead, letterhead and, and fax it to them or something like that. Yep. And it's like, geez. Yep. Um, now, I was honestly surprised to see the Bitcoin market actually sustain with Mt. Gox down. It's holding around 14 bucks. It really hasn't gone yep. up or down. Um, yeah, the Canadian exchange is currently... Uh, see if I see it on here. Thirteen dollars and fifty cents, which so, is what, where it's been. Yeah, yeah. So now it's actually up a bit from where it was on like uh, Monday. I'm honestly kind of, I'm kind of, I'm honestly kind of surprised to see it withstand this rather severe. Um, this is yeah. This honestly, is the primary kind of exchange. With with that exchange down, there was going to be a flood of people who mine bitcoins and need to sell them, or want to sell them, and so there was going to be an oversupply, and that was going to drive the price down. So far, it hasn't. No, Trade Hill really came online just at the perfect time. I mean, this is a huge boon yeah. for Trade Hill. But um, uh, I don't think they have any partners in Canada yet. No, I probably not. But they wanted for it, and it was fairly long. And uh, I don't know about in the States, but the very first thing they ask you in Canada when you go to create a new bank account is, will you be using this account on the instructions of any third party? What does that mean? Uh, it's an anti-money laundering law in Canada. So you're not allowed to? Well, I've never answered that I would be using my account on the instructions of somebody else, so I don't know what happens. Gotcha. But oh, oh, you're not saying they'll necessarily deny it, but they might monitor it or something. Yeah, or something. Gotcha. Uh, any other thoughts on the Mount Gox thing, or should we jump into uh, no, uh, I think feedback? we can get into the password thing now. All right, let's get in to TechSnap audience feedback. question this week came from Keith and normally we feature a couple of questions but we wanted to give this one like a very thorough answer and of course it fits the theme for this episode and it's something we really want to go drive home to you guys so we're going to dedicate uh, the, the feedback section to Keith's question and Alan Keith wrote in and he asked uh, can you explain salted hashing and two-factor authentication in more detail right uh, so some older websites, especially forum and uh, bespoke software, things people write themselves and don't necessarily follow the best practices, yeah. uh, store your password uh, just using a plain hash, right? Like MD5 or SSA1. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this is that those can be broken fairly easily. Like, like we, just, we were saying we about, yeah. uh, with rainbow tables, you can just look up the answer. If somebody's calculated it before, then you're good to go. Because the, the hash is derived from the source thing, so therefore it's right. always the same thing. Yeah, uh, hash is deterministic. If the same input will always have the same output. Yeah. And so a rainbow table means you just generate every possible input, and then you have every possible output, and you put them in a table, and you can look it up. Mm -hmm. uh, modern uh, hashing algorithms use a salt. Uh, this is, is, is some random characters that you add into it that are separate for each user. And hmm. this way, you would need a separate rainbow table for each user. Gotcha. On top of the fact that it makes the password longer, right? Like, if we've looked at the size of rainbow tables, every character you add makes them hugely bigger. And if, uh, by default, uh, MD5 type uh, salts attaches have eight characters of randomness. And those characters are a mix of uppercase and lowercase. And so a couple of symbols, so... Mm. It's just to make it more difficult. Well, I don't, want, yeah. I don't want to jump ahead, but the question that comes up in the chat room and the first one that came to mind, and I'm sure you're about to get to this, is if it's randomly added, how could you ever hope to decrypt it? Well, first of all, hashes, you never decrypt. They're one way. So what you do uh, is when you store the hash, you don't store just the hash part. Uh, so that's why, for example, with an MD5, if you look at it in like your shadow file on Linux, you'll see it's dollar sign one, and that first part identifies the algorithm. 1 is MD5, oh, uh, okay, right. 2A is Blowfish, right. and the SHA512 we're going to talk about is 6. Right. Then another dollar sign, and then that's where it stores the salt. So it remembers the salt separately. So then you'll see like 8 characters of randomness, and then another dollar sign, and then the hash. And what that hash is, is it's the password plus that random salt. So then when a user tries to log in, what you do is you take the password they're trying and that salt 
hash them together and see if the output's the same. If it is, then it's the right password. And if it's not, then it's the wrong password. Ah, I see. So it doesn't, uh, so it's able to drive the answer without ever actually having to be able to decrypt the password. Right. Because the whole point of hashing is that it's one way. So then you that, decrypt that decrypted version is never in a clear text state. So you're sort of inherently right. secure when it's stored like that. Right. Exactly. That's the idea. So that's why the only way to break uh, hashed passwords is by brute force because there's no way to decrypt them. Right. Boy, and that must take forever. Yeah. Well, when the uh, FreeBSD crypt method with MD5 was invented, uh, making it do the MD5 algorithm 100 times slowed it down enough that it took like 0.1 seconds to do one, which was plenty slow on like a Pentium 133 megahertz or whatever. Yeah. It was common at the time. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is to make sure that the salt is different for each account. Some forum software will use one salt on every account, and that means that you can, you know, assume that part of the password. Yeah. That wouldn't work. That essentially yeah, like defeats when the purpose I was, if you get that. Right. When I was uh, Googling around for looking at uh, boat SHA 512 hashing, because mm -hmm. I haven't actually used that before, uh, Speaking I saw about a couple gots. of people, yeah, a couple of people had, you know, implementations on that showed up on Google where it was literally just the salt, the password, and they just SHA 512 at one time. Hmm. That's not that good. No. Because then... If you so the advantage is that only if you if you do it, if you have a triple pass then it's three t it's theoretically three times harder to be able to like right. say brute force it on a GPU or something. But with the MD5 system, we were doing it a hundred times, uh. and that was more than ten years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and specifically SHA is faster than MD5, uh. <laughs> so it's less desirable for a password. Wow! Uh, but if you do it more times, then it works out. Uh, so one of the other advantages with the salt part is if two users happen to have the same password, they don't show up looking the same. The hashes right. are different because the salt is different. Right. Yeah, we have like, this handy graphic here for the video folks that have uh, right. two, you have two users named Bob. Well, no, two users with the password Bob. Or two pa yeah, two users with the password Bob. And in a, in a non-salted database, they just look like the same password. If you mix in that salt into the hash, then you get entirely different passwords. And how many of us out there that have users probably have users with a password of password123 or, you know, with or a capital? They, you know well, users. They just do what they have to. Some users will end up having two accounts for whatever reason. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so maybe they'll use the same password because they're the same person. And it's easier. Yeah. And uh, you end up with, this way, the attacker doesn't know that he's broken both accounts. Right. Good point. Good point. Now, he also asked about multi-factor authentication, though. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, all right, all right. You're almost there. Okay, all right, keep going. Uh, so when, with the SHA 512 implementation and uh, with the one that I use, Blowfish, um, what they do is they've made it adjustable. So oh. as part of that hash at the beginning, before the actual hash part, instead of just the salt, they've added an extra configuration parameter. For Blowfish, it's just a two-digit number. And what that determines is how many rounds, how many times the hashing algorithm is done. Uh, the default for Blowfish is seven. And what that, that's not actually seven, it's logarithmic. So it's 10 to the power of seven, which would be a million. Yeah. So Oof. it means take this password, mix in this salt, and then hash it a million times. Wow. So uh, is that just a race against the clock, though? Yeah. Literally? Well, the, the point, though, is that you can change that number. Ah. Say, so you can increase now the on, use eight, which means 10 million hashes. Wow. So okay. you keep turning that up, and every time you turn it up, it gets 10 times harder. So that over time, you can keep up with the fact that computer, uh, CPUs and GPUs are getting faster at cracking passwords. That makes sense. Uh, with the SHA 512 one, it's literally just the number of rounds. But what you can do is you can use not the same number of rounds for each user. You can randomly select between, say, 50,000 and 100,000 rounds for each user. So that way, if someone figures out a way to quickly figure out what something hashed 50,000 times is, each different user has a different number of those. Right, right. So rainbow tables and things like that are not effective. Yeah, so you can't just create a rainbow table based on <clears throat> 500, huh. or uh, 50,000 implementations of SSA 512. Right. Uh, on top of that, they also have stronger salts. 
Uh, SHA 512 uses 16 characters instead of MD5's 8, and Blowfish uses 22 characters. So that's a, that much more added to the password to make rainbow tables and so on that much harder. Mm. And this is all technology that's available right now. This isn't like yeah. experimental stuff that's being implemented in the future. This is available right uh, now. SHA 256 has been available in uh, OpenBSD for like at least five or six years. And probably similar on Linux, right? And you figure a yeah, lot of these websites uh, are uh, using Linux backends. Linux now have uh, SDJ 512 uh, that you can use. I know a few of them, if you have a really minimalistic uh, TTY, they won't be able to support it though. Hmm. Uh, but I found a bunch of how-to guides on how to set up your Linux to use SDJ 512 while I was looking for what it would look like. Oh, nice. It's the dollar sign six was the part I was looking for. I, I hadn't actually seen that one before. Oh, I know. But basically, the adjustable number of rounds is what is important because it means we can scale it up over time. Especially since, you know, nobody expected GPUs to be able to crack passwords at the rate they can now. Like, right. for example, if you're doing just straight MD5s, uh, uh, HD 6990, the card everybody wants to do Bitcoin hashing, <laughs> yep. uh, can do 11 billion MD5 hashes per second. Per second? Yes. That's 11 thousand mega hashes per second of md5 oh man imagine if bitcoin was md5 math that would be yeah. really something yeah wow that is, uh, is how many how many a second did you say 11 billion uh, well yeah 11 so eleven thousand mega hashes on the no. same card that can do about 700 mega hashes of bitcoin yeah wow wow so the bitcoin the bitcoin uh algorithm is significantly more complex well, because it's the uh, SHA 256 of the SHA 256 of the last Bitcoin or whatever. Right, right. Hmm. Now, did you want to get onto multi-factor or were you still talking yes. about salt? Uh, so, yeah. Um, and then the other part of the question was about multi-factor authentication. Yeah. Uh, and what that means is just using more than one way to confirm the user is who they claim to be. Uh, so, when you do two-factor authentication, it just means you're using two of the three different factors to identify the person rather than just one, which is typical. Uh, so, the different uh, types of authentication are something you know, like a username and password, right. the answer to a secret question, or your PIN number, or something like that. The ATM something, is a classic one. Yeah. Uh, so, something you have, like, like an a, ID card. Or a debit uh, card. One of those uh, RSA secure tokens, or a swipe card, an RFID card. Or in the case, like we talked about Google the other week, uh, no. your cell phone can yep. be something you have. Mm -hmm. And the other one is something you are or something you do, which is something like your fingerprint scan, retina scan, your signature, like on a credit card, or uh, a voice sample. Ah. Voice sample yeah. seems like it could be possible for a lot of sites, for a lot of high-tech sites, you know? It seems mm -hmm. like you could maybe implement so, that. Uh, like you were saying, the ATM is uh, a common example of two-factor authentication. It's something you have, your bank card, and something you know, the PIN number. Right. Uh, however, the PIN number is not a very strong authenticator, right? There's only usually four or six digits to it. Mm -hmm. And it's digits, not doesn't include letters, right? Right. Uh, but also in recent weeks, we've talked about things like the RSA security tokens, something you have, of being compromised, and people have managed to break in because of that. Or uh, other forms of attack like the Zeus Trojan, which just waits until you authenticate for whatever, <laughs> you know, your regular activity and then takes advantage once you're already authenticated right it waits like the, the whole point of the Zeus trojan was to defeat those extra security measures at your bank is that you know if you have one of those fancy token things they just wait until you log into your bank with your token right and then they start doing i'll just hang out and wait no rush yeah let them log like, in you got we're targeting people with lots of money we can wait yeah we're okay we're comfy uh yeah. wow so uh that that was what the zeus trojan that's the one we talked about the other week that uh, stole the, like half a million dollars yep. from the construction company. Right. Oh yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, wow. Okay. So there. Well, there. Jeez. Now there. Uh, there you go, Keith. How about that for a uh, for an answer? I like that. Now all the everything Alan just covered because it was a lot of stuff is also in the show notes. So if you want to read the details of the answer, because I also uh, included a link to uh, the to lecture it. I wrote uh, on this when I used to teach a Unix security class, and it kind of gets into a little more detail about how the password hashing actually works. And in a bunch of the things like that. Nice. All right. Now, uh, we got a couple of more stories here I thought we'd round out. Yep. What do you say? Should we jump into it? Sure.
All right, so uh, let's talk about the Bitcoin Blaster segment. This is just a couple of quick Bitcoin updates. And the first one up is AMD is announcing a new Fusion System architecture. And Alan, you suggest that maybe this might affect the uh, speed at which people can Bitcoin mine? Yeah, so basically the Fusion System is, is bringing CPUs and GPUs more together and being less discreet about them. Uh, but, you know, everybody's just wondering, if the 6990 can do that much, what's the next card going to do? Right. Right. And I've also heard like ASIC processors might be on the way in the, in the next year yep. or so and things like that. So mm -hmm. you could look at, you know, a massive improvement in the ability to calculate the uh, Bitcoins. Yep. An interesting story. Now, also uh, and, another... You know, how will that affect the economy and people are mining and there's all kinds and of the, questions. The difficulty rate and things like that. Yep. And, and uh, yeah, so, boy. Uh, also, a story that seems to be affecting a lot of people in the, in the Bitcoin Blaster segment, in fact, the last Bitcoin story of the episode, is uh, Symantec posted on their official Symantec security blog that uh, a Trojan has been detected in the wild whose, I believe, right, his essential purpose is to steal people's wallets? Yes, and they actually have the full source code for it here, and literally it just looks for your home directory for the user you, that the virus runs as, uh, looks for your Bitcoin wallet file, and then... FTPs it to their server with a random file name so that it doesn't overwrite somebody else's wallet. Pretty adorable, really. Actually, it's a it's a it's a pretty simplistic, it's ridiculously simple. Yeah, and it's and uh, it fits in like we talked about the other week. You want to make sure you don't have this trojan. You want to make sure that you maybe run your Bitcoin uh, wallet as a different user than your regular everyday browsing user. So that's if a great you get tip. Virus, it doesn't necessarily go after. Like this one doesn't actually search your hard drive, but some of them eventually will. Look yeah. around your hard drive to find yeah. this wallet file. Yeah. yeah. But one of the things you can do is use a different uh, directory other than the default to store your Bitcoin wallet in. Yep. That's what Blisk was just asking in the chat room, and that would be a good way to go. And then uh, yep. uh, the other thing I recommend is cut new wallets from time to time. That way you don't yep. have everything. It's like it's like putting your money in multiple safes. Yes. And we talked a lot about this stuff in last week's episode. So if you missed that, go back go and watch. We have a whole section on things you can do to try to protect your Bitcoins. Now, before we get out of here, uh, what do you say we do a quick little lulsec roundup? Because they've had a busy yep. week, and I just wanted to give a mention. Uh, first of all, one cool thing for the geeks out there is uh, it looks like the, the tool that lulsec uses to do their SQL injections. And, and remember, SQL injections are not necessarily a sophisticated attack, and so it's not surprising no, to find out. the most common type of attack on the Internet. Yeah, it's, websites. and it's not common to find out. It's not surprising to find out that there's a nice little tool out there to help you automate the process. So uh, Havaji, I'm not exactly sure how you would say it, is the advanced SQL injection tool that lets you automate things like SQL injection testing, including they even include a nice little feature tart, chart comparing mm -hmm. the commercial version and their open source version. And it tells you like you know what databases it can go after and things like that. And people believe this is the tool that Lulsec's been using to get to a lot of these little prizes that they've had recently. So if yep. you want to read about that, link in the show notes. Um, Alan, let's talk about this story here that the uh, it sounds like potentially the Lulsec ringleader has been uh, arrested in the UK. What do you think? You think this is you think it's legit? It's hard to say. And especially with things like Anonymous and Lulsec, it's hard to say if there's any one leader per se. Right. You know? Yeah, they mocked on their Twitter feed. They said, seems like the glorious leader of Lulz arrested. It's all over now. Wait, still here. Which poor bastard did they take down? So a little, yeah. like, you didn't get us kind of a thing, but... Yeah, so, you know, even if it was somebody, they're not going to admit that, right? They're going to make it look like they arrested somebody. But this would be, if it's not the right person, that'll be the second or third person the FBI's arrested and said was from Lulzsec, and Lulzsec's like, no, they're not. Yeah, of course that's what they're going to say, though, right? Right, but then again, you know, how is the FBI, what evidence does the FBI have that this person is in Lulzsec? Um, the other, yeah, and what difference does it make though, unless he gives information? Yep. I guess that's the key thing is if you provide that too, yeah. some sort of actionable intelligence. Uh, the last, I thought the last Lulzsec story we'd cover here in the, in the fast round was, uh, Lulzsec is now teamed up with, if everybody remembers, Anonymous. And, uh, so, you know, two great flavors go great together, I guess. I honestly am getting a little tired of the Lulzsec, Lulzsec stuff. That's why we threw it in the, uh, kind of compressed section of the show. Instead of but uh, honestly, it is culturally interesting to watch this happen. I don't think it's like anything yep. we've seen before. And it's interesting that uh, a new group called Lulzsec Exposed has popped up, uh, which includes a couple of former FBI agents and some other people that are fed up with Lulzsec, and they're doing what they can to try to uh, gather evidence and so on against uh, Lulzsec and, return it and give it to the authorities. That's interesting. That yeah, I saw that it was a former FBI agent. I thought that was really somebody with connections, but not. But now he works outside the system. A rogue yeah. agent goes to take down an elite hacker group. 
Very sounds Hollywood. Sounds like a bad movie. Yeah, it did. It sounds very Hollywood. Uh, okay, yep. just a couple of stories out of our lightning round before we skip yep. out of here for the day. Mozilla is retiring Firefox 4. You might have seen that Firefox 5 is actually out now. And uh, Yeah, that was that was quick, considering yeah. that uh, 3 and 3.6 lasted quite a while. They're, right. Uh, now, they're saying it's going to be end of life for vulnerability patches, and I'm not quite sure when this kicks in. I don't know if it's like active immediately, but it's coming up. So, But the main complaint people have had is, uh, especially with the major version bumps, is you don't always have the plugin compatibility. Yep. So a lot of people are still on 4 because their favorite plugin isn't ready for 5 just yet. Honestly, it's sometimes it's, the plugins are the number one reason I still use Firefox. So when they break those, they're kind of breaking the main driver for me to use Firefox. Yeah. So and I, I so haven't updated sure. I'm not sure why they called the new one Firefox 5 instead of 4.1 or whatever. Because they want to get hustling, I guess. They're, you know, maybe they're yeah. trying to keep up with Chrome, which is on like version 12 billion now or something. Right, but what's the... I don't know. What's the point? I don't, I don't, why is the version number got to be that big difference? But anyway. Yeah, apparently, there's not all that big a difference between 4 and 5. I haven't actually looked. I'm still at 3.6. I guess it's not so much that they're trying They're trying to redefine what deserves a new version number is what they say. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last story in the lightning round, Alan, is the story that Google and they're building developer tools where you can flag vulnerabilities inside common web apps. And uh, this right. is... Right. So it's, Go ahead. it's called the DOM snitch and specifically... Uh, the DOM it's looking snitch. At, uh, <laughs> the changes in the DOM that could be unsafe. So looking for JavaScript and so on that's trying to do cross-site scripting and other kind of hijacking. I like so that. It's basically a plugin that watches what's going on in the browser and looks for anything hinky. That's uh, pretty good. I don't know how good it is yet. Uh, on Slashdot, there was a number of people saying that if you turn it on, you, it broke Slashdot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, specifically, uh, the like showing and hiding of the comments and so on. Well, okay. Maybe it's not broken then. <laughs> I make a joke. Uh, yeah. I, I like this though. I think I think a tool like this is extremely valuable and yeah. awesome for Google. For boy, Google's been. Sometimes I get on. I sometimes I get a little. I get a little hater rate against Google, but they're on my good well, guy list I this think week. Part of it is you know a lot of these projects come into that twenty percent time rule, right? Yeah, I bet. It's like you know that's and then that's usually the stuff I like too. Yeah, well, it's because that's where real innovation comes from. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing to keep that little rule around. From people, not companies. Won't it be interesting if that is one of the main things that keeps Google nimble over the years? Or you know, are they going to go the way of Microsoft and IBM and get big and slow down? Or will this twenty percent time? I think a little you know, bit of both. They are getting big and slowing down and being harder to be yeah, agile. Yeah, it kind of does but seem like that's starting to happen. Still letting people come up with these ideas, they still yeah. have this flexibility. As long as they're still recognizing them, right? As long as they're yeah. still able to recognize that they're good ideas. And and this seems like it could be one of them. And uh, I honestly, if they get this thing nailed down, I'd, I'd be up for using it. Yep. So there you go. Well, Alan, is there any other business we should take care of this episode? No, I think we're pretty much good. Awesome. All right, everyone. Well, here's the details. TechSnap comes out every Friday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and you will find some of the most epic show notes of your life over on every single post for the show with links to everything we talk about, including links to download this episode in pretty much every format you could want from HD to mobile and audio only. This makes a great commuting buddy. And also we have RSS feeds where you can subscribe. And if you are an iTunes user, you can actually significantly help the show by rating and uh, reviewing in iTunes. Ideally, we'd hope it's a positive review, but whatever you'll yes, give us, please. we'll take. <laughs> yeah. I know not most of you out there are iTunes users, but those of you who are, uh, it would help with exposure for the show, and that is always a good thing for everyone because the show actually gets better with more downloads. It's science. It's amazing. It's yeah. just how it works. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you next Friday. <laughs>